Okay, I'll make a start. Thank you so much. Thanks to everybody for the invitation. Um, it's great to be here. I can't see anybody at the moment, so I'm assuming everyone is still there and not abandoned me yet for lunch. Um, as usual, in true academic style, I have tried to cover probably too much ground. <laughs> so what I would say is if anyone has any particular questions of clarification or that they'd like to follow up with, um, please do get in touch. So that's a QR code to my LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn and um, X formerly known as Twitter, so I don't get sued. Uh, that's my, uh, my handle there. Um, just to outline the position of the presentation before I start. Um, as was said, I do a lot of work around race equity, and that is very much the lens through which I'm going to talk through today. Um, in terms of talent, I'm also referring to first year undergraduate students. Um, and it's a very UK context in which I'm speaking in. Um, friends on the call will know, as has been said, I'm very passionate about students and see all students um, as people and as future life opportunities um, and contributors to our global society. But the presentation that I'm going to give today is quite data heavy um, because I think it's really, really important that in understanding some of the points that I want to make through a kind of EDI, racialized, broader context. So it's entitled The Reality of Differential Outcomes. Talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. And the first thing that I want to do is demystify a little bit this idea of talent scarcity. So as I say, looking specifically at first time undergraduate degree talent in universities, we have loads of it. <laughs> so we have 2.83 million students in our um, higher education system at the moment, studying first time undergraduate degrees. Uh, most of those students, as, as you all know, are studying business and management, um, but are spread across lots of different disciplines. We obviously also have a student population that is made up of different uh, demographics. But again, looking specifically at ethnicity, we can see that though we have a high proportion of white students at 71.5%. Actually, that's an underrepresentation when we compare that with the national population of white people um, in the UK, which is around 87%. Similarly, when we look at black students, we have 4% of our UK population is black, but we actually have an overrepresentation in university where we have 8.5% of our students um, come from um, a black racial categorization. So I just think it's very important to keep these things in mind when I'm going to go on to talk about opportunity and talent. So I'm talking about graduate jobs, again, very specific context in which I'm talking about opportunity. And there is lots and lots of debate about what a graduate job actually is, but I would suggest that it's one for which a degree is deemed to be appropriate training but also acknowledging that there are alternative pathways and routes into these jobs. And again, I think this is really important when we think about opportunity and we think about the talent for that opportunity. At the end of 2021, 86.7% of graduates were employed compared with non-graduates, which was 70.2%. So obviously you get a good return on having a degree in terms of employment. We can also see that if you um, are a graduate, 78% um, of graduates were employed in highly skilled jobs, um, which is much higher than the non-graduate figure. But what's important also to acknowledge is that whilst we have a high number of graduates that are employed, we obviously have nearly 9% of graduates who are employed, but are not in a highly skilled job. So, you know, what might be classed as a SOC one to three occupation. Also important to note that 3.2% um, of our graduates are unemployed. So the question is, is it a demand for graduates or actually is it a demand for skills? And UUK published a report last year called Busting Graduate Job Myths where there was a lot of commentary around the fact that actually it's not about a strong demand for graduates, bearing in mind, as I say, we have these graduate jobs where there are alternative pathways to those jobs, but it's actually about the skills 
that employers want. And I find this learning agility particularly interesting because I think there is a signaling that comes with having a degree about learning agility that I do think feeds into um, employers thinking and perceptions around graduates. We also know from the report that there is a shortfall in the number of professional jobs that are um, available in the market compared with workers who have degrees to fill them. And that is one million, so that is really significant. We have twice as many people who are underqualified than overqualified. And actually professional jobs have risen in the last two decades, almost exponentially, where we've moved from just over 11 million jobs to just under 16 million jobs in that time. So for the very first time, actually, the majority of UK jobs are professional level jobs. And we have 16.2 million people who are employed into those jobs. So it is likely that half of our UK workers have got degrees. Now, when we put an ethnicity lens on that again, for those of you who work in EDI, for those of you who are working in this space, it is of no surprise that white graduates have the highest employment rate and they have the highest highly skilled employment rate. Um, black graduates have the highest in unemployment rates and they also have the lowest highly skilled employment rates. So you put an ethnicity lens um, over this and, and it looks very different. When we look at highly skilled employment rates, so these SOC one to three classifications, it absolutely would seem that having a degree is going to make you more likely to access highly skilled work. And we can see that the postgraduates um, have a much higher number, over 12% um, difference from our graduates um, in accessing highly skilled work. So having those awards, those qualifications, absolutely adds value in terms of being able to access these highly skilled employment jobs. Um, again, when you look at it from an ethnicity perspective, the variation in the difference between highly skilled employment rates is much bigger than it is just about getting um, a job, which is important for when we're going to talk about um, degree award. But let's just start thinking and looking at what a graduate skill actually is, particularly at graduate level, again, acknowledging that for a graduate job, you have different pathways in accessing that job. So we all know, you know, there's um, a narrative around skills that is about all of these things, including things like creativity, applied creativity, thinking about critical thinking. But we also know when we look at what people are actually doing in work, that there has been an organization or occupation led or driven degraduatization of work. So what does that mean? Some people might frame it as a degradation of graduate work because we have a situation where I can have a student, as a lapsed accountant, I still teach accounting. I can have a graduate who studied accounting with me, who gets a job as an associate and is set, sat next to a school leaver on an apprenticeship scheme and they are doing the same work. We have advanced nurse practitioners now in um, health who, again, are um, studying up to master's level, but are doing work that traditionally GPs and doctors would do. And we also see in law, paralegals are absolutely instrumental to law firms and, again, taking on some of the work that solicitors do. So there is a degraduatization of work um, that means that actually Having your award, your degree, being a graduate um, and the skills that come with that would seemingly also be found elsewhere where you can be on these alternative pathways and access and be able to do the same work in work. And of course, we have nearly 9% of our graduates who are not highly skilled or sorry, who are not in highly skilled jobs. And we have this 1 million um, shortfall in professional jobs compared with the workers with a degree to fill them. And so a lot of what I talk about in terms of access to a graduate job is that we need to think beyond skills. Skills are hugely important without question, but to actually access an opportunity 
which is what the title of my presentation was referring to, I think work readiness is really critical. And in the literature, we talk about work readiness in terms of a form of organisational professionalism, which you can see it's an academic talking, is a construct that is based on perceptions, right? What the employer perceives of the would-be employer in terms of what they are going to be able to bring to the business and how successful they are going to be in role. Because this is in the absence of training. So there are all sorts of things that students need, not just the skills themselves, which we know can be gained elsewhere seemingly because there are other pathways into these jobs. But these students, these graduates need obviously to be able to articulate their skills. We all know about the value of work experience, but why is that? Part of that is because it's deemed to kind of prove that these students have met organisational professionalism and the risk is deemed to be lower um, by the employer. There's this notion of embodied professional behaviour and what that looks like in terms of dress code, haircuts, hairstyles, um, piercings, tattoos, how you present yourself. Um, we still know, despite what lots and lots of people will say, the evidence shows us that actually the professional networks, the school that you went to, the university that you went to, still makes a difference. Not in all cases, but still makes a difference. Access bias, there was that fantastic documentary on Channel 4, I think it was, or the BBC, I should say, um, that talked about the role that access bias plays in graduates being able to access these roles. And of course, human capital, within which we have our degree award. And it says something to employers, um, as we'll see in the data, that if you have a degree that says something about your human capital, your skills, your competencies, your knowledge, but the classification of award, it would seem, is still very important in those perceptions. And all of this is happening within a context where we have increasing market demand, as we've seen, we have alternative pathways, training budgets that are being cut, relocation packages that are used to try and lure people in, EDI targets, CV scanning, so many other contextual factors that our students, again, need to be aware of beyond just the skills that they need to be able to demonstrate because a lot of graduates are trained to do the function of their role once they're in role. And most graduate jobs, as we know, are degree neutral. So, you know, a question or a provocation that I would have is what are graduates getting from us within universities that they don't get as a non-graduate in order to access highly skilled work? Because being a graduate is not working for everyone. So TESO again published a report last year, and as usual, again, for those of you working in this space, you will not be surprised to know if you are a woman, if you are from a racially minoritized background, if you are from a lower socioeconomic background, that there are gaps in terms of pay, in terms of uh, graduate roles, um, in terms of progression. There are huge um, ethnicity gra gaps across um, those different ethnicities. And so when we're thinking about opportunity, you're thinking about how talent can access that opportunity. Of course, social mobility comes to mind. And what we know, particularly from the work of people like the brilliant Charlie Ball, is that geography is important. When we look at the different regions within the UK, obviously, um, we know through immigration that um, there are variable rates of ethnicity in different areas. London has the highest percentage of so-called BAME people, so Black, Asian, minority, ethnic people, and the lowest percentage of white people. Um, London also has the highest percentage of Black people. We know the Northeast and Wales have the lowest percentage of Black people. And of course, because of time, I could refer to lots of different ethnicities, but they're the ones that I've picked out because of the significance of what I'm going to talk about in terms of differential outcomes. So the Institute for Fiscal Studies would suggest that actually social mobility and particularly geographical mobility is much weaker for ethnic minorities, for racially minoritized people and for people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. 
So, you know, in terms of ethnicity, again, Black and Asian people are less likely to um, benefit from this mobility premium that we see. When you disaggregate BAME, so Black, Asian, minority, ethnic, Chinese students do really well in terms of average earnings, as do Indian students, comparative to other BAME categories. And so we see that Black other has the lowest average earnings after one year. So again, really important not to think of BAME as a monolith. And when we think about graduate migration in terms of accessing opportunity, there are, of course, a large number of students that do migrate, but there are students that don't. And we know that cities such as London, Brighton, Leeds and Bristol actually already have relatively high numbers of higher education participation. But there are also those cities that have incomers, those people who leave their hometowns or cities and move for um, work. And of course, Charlie Ball has framed, as I'm sure many of you know, um, graduate migration in these four categories. And what's really important to know is that, you know, two thirds of graduates actually stay local. They study, they might move away, but they come back and loyals don't actually move at all. So two thirds of our graduates are coming back home um, to work. And typically there will be people from kind of lower participation areas. Uh, there'll be women and um, there'll be mature students. The incomers, so those who are leaving their hometowns or cities and moving away for work, and half of the incomers move to London, as you can imagine, um, for careers such as engineering, um, are men, white men, and they're well paid and they're in high participation um, areas. So graduate migration in terms of where students land or actually the barriers to the moving for opportunities um, is obviously another really important factor in terms of um, talent accessing opportunities. So if we look to the future, UK um, did the um, Jobs of the Future report this year, it was just published a month ago. Um, and you can see the table on the left there talking about all the different new graduate roles across the different geographical areas that are going to be needed to be filled by 2035. And we can see that the highest growth levels are in areas such as Wales, the northeast of England and Yorkshire and the Humber, which if you think about the graph that we had before where we looked at ethnicities and the fact that these are cities that have a lot of loyals, again, you can see that that means that a lot of the talent that is going to access those new opportunities will be local. That would be a reasonable prediction, given that the graduate migration patterns haven't really changed hugely. Um, but we are in a context where employers are looking at things like remote working or hybrid working. Um, and might there be a switch to kind of standardizing that as practice because of these kind of graduate um, migration patterns? Again, given that um, accessing talent can be quite difficult in some areas. And what will this mean for universities? What will it mean for anchor universities or early um, career talent teams, or indeed schools and colleges and universities that offer alternative pathways into graduate jobs? And also be mindful, we have 9% of our graduates who are working, but not in highly skilled jobs. So there's untapped talent there as well. The UK report suggests that we're going to need 11 million extra graduates um, to fill these jobs. And that rather than the 50.5% that we saw of professional jobs, um, that we're actually going to see 88% of new jobs will be at the graduate level by 2035. And so some questions of provocation that I have, you know, is it a demand for graduates or actually is it a demand for skills? Um, and this is important because of our provision, because of degraduatization of work and alternative pathways, because of all of these contextual factors. 26% um, of UK workers are underqualified for the job that they're in. 
And we know we have a shortage in STEM, particularly engineering, in health or allied sciences to medicine, and also um, teachers. Do universities have the capacity to train more? Um, and is there the supply to be able to train more students or are alternative pathways going to become more, more prevalent? And of course, there are more graduate level jobs than graduates that we, as we have at the moment. So why do we have graduates who are not in highly skilled work? So I just want to move briefly, I'm conscious of time, um, briefly to um, differential graduate outcomes and look at the association between um, those and degree awards. So spoken about the fact that if you have a degree that gives seemingly gives you really better access or enhanced access to um, highly skilled jobs. When you look at degree classification, we see that there's not really that much difference in terms of accessing employment or highly skilled jobs if you have a 2-1 or a first, a so-called good degree. But there are big differentials, obviously, if you have um, a lower second or a third class degree, both across highly skilled and employment rates. And that the gaps between two twos and thirds is much bigger than it is between getting a first or a two one. When we look at the awarding of degrees over the last five years, of course, there's been lots of rhetoric in the news about grade inflation. We know that the impact of COVID actually meant that um, our degree award gaps um, didn't close, but they reduced. But in the last year, um, unfortunately, that degree award gap has increased again to almost pre-pandemic pandemic, um, levels. So what that means is that there's been a widening of the difference between the numbers of students or the proportion of students who are white who are getting two ones and firsts against other students who are classified as being Black, Asian, minority, ethnic. More qualifications were awarded for business and management than any other subject, so that's a pattern that's continued. Um, over a quarter were um, awarded to subjects allied to medicine. In education and teaching, actually 77% of those awards went to women, and in engineering, 78% were awarded to men. And again, I mentioned these because these are industries and sectors where uh, we have a shortfall in supply. Demand is outstripping supply. Um, this is a slide I'm going to skip over very briefly, but other than to say that one of the big contributors to the award gap has been the fact that there has been an increase in the number of firsts that have been awarded, which have predominantly been white students. Um, and that that increase has been much bigger in comparison to the increase that we've seen in the award to two one of two ones, sorry, to so-called BAME students. And so again, you can see these differentials and how they play out in terms of award. So we have some improvement over the last two academic years in terms of um, specific ethnic groups achieving two ones or firsts. As has historically been the case, white students do comparatively better than any other group, but we also see within BAME that actually Chinese and Indian students who you may remember in terms of graduate outcomes and in terms of jobs and in terms of um, average salary do much better um, than black and Pakistani students. So there is definitely um, a mirroring of outcomes in terms of jobs um, aligned with graduate, um, sorry, um, degree award. So it's, for me, it's the same old story. Um, we obviously have some low participation areas and there's a narrative around so-called working class uh, men being the most unlikely group to access higher education. And as I said right at the beginning, if you are black, you are more likely to go to university. Um, London has the highest proportion of black and so-called BAME students. It also has 25% of graduate jobs, um, but the region also has half of the incomers um, coming in to access that, those jobs. Black and Chinese students are the most likely to go to university and Chinese students do comparatively much better. If you are a black student, 
With three A's at A-level, you are less likely to get a 2-1 or a first degree than a white student with two B's and a C at A-level. Black and Pakistani students are least likely to get a placement or an internship. And we know that black students are the most likely group to drop out of university and that only a quarter of black graduates earn above £25,000 compared with white students and Asian students for whom the proportion is much higher. And as I said already, Indian and Chinese students earn the highest average annual salary of all the categories within Bay. So what are we going to do about it or what's been, been done about it? Because actually, as I said right at the beginning, talent is everywhere, opportunity is not, and it's about access to opportunity and it's about the equity to level up that access to opportunity because quite frankly we have some students in the system who will be okay who will be okay regardless and we clearly have some students who are not so what's encouraging is that the IC has reported that employers are changing um, their requirements so this idea of the classification of award being really important is something that we're seeing people look at um, and for the first time uh, less than half of employers are asking for a 2-1 um, and we can see that less than one in ten are asking for specific UCAS um, points. We can also see in the um, early career talent market if you like some fantastic initiatives like the 10,000 Black Interns Foundation which many of you will be aware of which you know is a space for people to obviously gain that work experience but alongside that they get mentoring they have a safe space where students can really understand what these professional behaviors what this organizational professionalism um, looks like and then obviously develop those skills within role um, and that is specifically for black and disabled students we have T-level qualifications, which is another alternative pathway that very much focuses on skills. Um, and we have all these kind of career ready and locally funded initiatives to, to support students to access these opportunities because local is really important in terms of opportunity. So the key takeaways, white students are less likely to do an undergraduate degree, but have markedly better outcomes in terms of everything. Chinese and Indian students have much better outcomes in terms of everything than Black and Pakistani students. Graduate migration um, patterns would suggest that two thirds of our students stay local. So this really impacts on opportunity and access to work. Demand is set to increase and we already have existing shortages within engineering, health and teacher training. So what does that mean for our provision? Demand is not for graduates. It's the value that graduates are perceived to bring to employers. And this is within a context of alternative pathways, degraduatization of work, early career talent, budget cuts, et cetera. The achievement of a so-called good degree, a 2-1 or a first or a postgraduate award seemingly gives more access to highly skilled graduate work. So the value of a degree is unquestionable but you don't need a degree to access graduate work. And therefore all students, particularly those who aren't achieving two ones and firsts need support to develop their work readiness, not just their skills. And that's it from me. Thank you very much. Are you still there? Yes, we're all still here. Thank you so much, Joey. That was that was super interesting um, a really clear explanation of what is a really complex topic. There's so much in there um, and there's so much um, nuance between all those different statistics as well. It, it was really interesting to hear explanation. Um, we are bumping up very close to lunch now. Um, so we have um, probably time for just maybe one question. Um, and um, I'll take this one from the chat, um, which is um, probably drawing on from a, a little bit different part of your expertise than that which you've been talking about. But it's a question, I think, from an academic in the in the chat, and it's, have you got any tips on how to encourage academics to support students to become work ready and to engage with their careers? Mm. It's a really, really good question. Um, I think the difficulty always is 
is that it's not necessarily about academics not wanting to help. There are all sorts of pressures, um, conflicting demands um, on time and priorities, I suppose. So I think um, some of what's been mentioned before really about leveraging existing stuff is really important. So this idea, as we all know, um, about making sure it's in the curriculum because it's inclusive then if it's important it should be in the in the curriculum but actually for me a lot of this stuff is about having open and honest conversation about the fact if you look a certain way if you speak a certain way if you're from a particular background not that it's impossible but this is how you have to navigate things to access these opportunities or if you want to do this we know your family is really important but you might need to consider moving away or well, this is what employers value in terms of work experience. This is what you... So I think those really honest, open conversations beyond your CV has to look really shiny is really important. And then actually equipping them with the skills needs to be in the curriculum, but then surfacing that and ensuring that students know <laughs> what they're getting, how to apply it and how to talk about it in an interview is, again, a really, really important part of being work ready. And if you can do all of that kind of within personal tutor sessions, within things that are happening already, within curriculum, within units or modules, and it's not seen as a bolt on, you might get more academics sort of engaged. And I also believe in the power of stories. So appealing to hearts and minds, I think, is really important as well. So true. Absolutely perfect ad advice there. Not ha um, having careers seen as a bolt on and really integrating it into the whole student experience is absolutely key, I think. Well, thank you so much, Zoe. Um, so much love for that session in the chat. Um, such brilliant comments. Um, we're so uh, delighted that you've been able to join us.